A little, uh, little word of confession to begin. I woke up at 4.15 to go to the bathroom like you do. <laughs> Went back to bed, checked the alarm, thought I'm good. Next thing I woke up, it was 5.49. Alarm clock. And I'm here. And I made it. <laughs> Didn't even wake up my wife. But the, the, anyway, all right. Just to remind you that um, the, the drop-off for the, the, sh the Shoes for Haiti drive, you've heard about that. That's next Friday, November 16th. So you can mark your bags or boxes with your table number on them. Please do that if you're bringing shoes. Here next Friday, November 16th, mark your bag or box that you're bringing the shoes in with your table number on them. And leave the, at the trailer, there'll be a trailer parked right out in the front there. You can leave the shoes there. Please uh, don't forget, November 16th, next Friday, Shoes for Haiti. Brian told me this was the worst joke of the year, but here you go. <laughs> An attractive young woman walks up to a department. This is, I shouldn't even tell this joke in this, this cultural moment we're in, but Brian wrote it down, so. An attractive young woman walks up to a department st uh, store, uh, shoe uh, store's fabric counter, excuse me, and says, I'd like to buy uh, this material for a new dress. How much does it cost? The young uh, storekeeper said, only one kiss per yard, ma'am with a smirk on his face, obviously not paying attention to our cultural moment. That's fine, said the girl, I'll take 10 yards. With expectation and anticipation written all over his face, the clerk quickly measured out the cloth, wrapped it up, and teasingly held it out to her. The girl snapped up the package, pointed to the old man behind the counter, and said, Grandpa is going to pay the bill. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Last week we had, uh, we, we looked at the next man up, the story of Moses um, and Joshua, Aaron, and her, and how Joshua went to battle against their enemies, the Amalekites. Remember, uh, holding his, as uh, long as his hands were raised, they succeeded, when they were lowered, they began to fail, and it's how we need each other in battle, helping each other in battle. Aaron and her held his arms steady. We asked these questions, what battles are you facing, and who's fighting with you? in the form of prayer. Today we look at the story of Moses again, and how he transitions leadership, hands it over to Joshua, his, his protege and the one that would take the leadership for him, which is really, it's, there's a lot of relevant lessons in the Moses-Joshua relationship. We're gonna look specifically at the handing off of leadership of God's people right before they cross the Jordan in the Promised Land from Moses to Joshua. But first, we're going to watch this clip from one of my all-time favorite movies. I saw it nine times in the theaters, the movie Braveheart. Wait. I respect what you said, but remember that these men have lands and castles. It's much to risk. And the common man that bleeds on the battlefield, does he risk less? No. But from top to bottom, this country has got no sense of itself. Its uh, nobles share allegiance with England. Its clans war with each other. Right. Right. If you make enemies on both sides of the border, you'll end up dead. We all end up dead. It's just a question of how uh, and why. I'm not a coward. I want what you want. But we need the nobles. We need them. Aye. Nobles. <laughs> now tell me, what does that mean to be noble? Your title gives you claim to the throne of our country. But men don't follow titles. They follow courage. Now, our people know you. Noble and common, they respect you. And if you would just lead them to freedom, they'd follow you. And so would I. That, uh, I sure wish we could have showed you the battle scenes this morning. <laughs> that line is such a powerful line. Men don't follow titles, they follow courage, they follow leadership. And then earlier, at the, before they leave the, the castle there at Edinburgh, Wallace has this speech, which is actually part of this, is carved on a stone, the Wallace National Monument in, in Scotland, where he, I've been there too, by the way. Um, I was a little bit, went through a little bit of a William Wallace phase in my adulthood. But he, uh, he says, you, ex you believe the people of this country exist to provide you with position. I believe your position exists to provide them with freedom. And I go to see that they have it. That's the scene right before he walked out. 
um, which is a pretty, pretty powerful thing. So now let's look at the text this morning, see where we can make the connection. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 1 through 8. The word Deuteronomy means second law, and the whole book is a repetition. It tells the story of the passing of the baton to Joshua, but the rest of the book before this is the story, is the repetition of the law. It's like before you go into the promised land, in a sense, God is saying to his people, I want to make sure you get my word straight. So he repeats almost the entire law. That's what the name of the book means. All right, verses 1 through 8. Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I'm now 120 years old, and I'm no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you will take possession of their land. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you, as the Lord said. And the Lord will do to them what he said to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. So Moses is not going to enter the promised land. He's led the people for 40 years in the wilderness. This is, we don't have time to get into the reasons why, but there's, he disobeyed a particular command of God and God had told him beforehand, you're going to lead him this far, but you're not going to go all the way in. Even that itself is worth thinking about for a minute. Moses is without question, one of the greatest leaders of, in all of human history. What he accomplished in the wilderness, leading a million people for 40 years, and it's remarkable what God used him to do. And what he, he was a man of great vision and leadership. We tend to think in our culture that you would go from the desert to the palace. You go from the wilderness wandering to like, you know, you make it, you establish yourself, you become the leader of a great nation. So for 40 years, he leads them out of Egypt, and they're wandering, and then he's not going to make it in. That alone is, I think, is different than how we would think of a successful leader. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, doesn't, it won't be on the screens. Moses is listed here several times. This is what they call the Faith Hall of Fame. Some of you read this chapter. And the, each section begins with by faith, and it talks about another one of the great heroes of our faith. Referring to all of them, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak this make it clear they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for has prepared for them a city. Meaning, Moses does not enter the earthly promised land, the land of Canaan. He doesn't make it in. He dies on the other side of the Jordan. But he does see it from afar, and he does, is in a sense, from the writer of Hebrews says, looking at a different goal. Obedience to God and his plan. The wisdom of Moses is really pretty remarkable in this context. He's, um, He's beginning to understand that he's not central to the work of God on earth. No human being other than Jesus Christ is, or was, or ever is. If you think about that for a minute, no human being, no man or woman, is ever central, indispensable to the work of God on earth. I am not saying that God doesn't use people. He's used them tremendously in my own life, and in our church, and in your life as well, and in this world. But nobody is central, indispensable, can't do without them in the work of God. And I think you don't have to look very far around the Chicagoland area to see megachurch pastors in trouble, making huge mistakes. Most of that is entirely on them, and there's corruption of power and abuse of power and the sin in their own life, and I tremble at that and pray against that in my own life. But on the other hand, we also live in a culture in which we prop this stuff up. There's something in human beings in us that wants the hero, that wants the perfect leader, that wants someone to be the end-all, be-all, and nobody is that. None of us are that. 
And it's not good for us when we attach ourselves to human beings that way. In fact, you should always watch out for any leader, Christian leader, that's trying to link you to themselves and not to God. That's a, that should be a big red flag. If the link is to me or to this movement or to this person, and you should never do that either, the people that you're leading. We want to always connect them to the one who's leading them. Moses has led him for 40 years, but it really, he's not indispensable. God is. And God is going to cross the Jordan. And God is already there. He says so. I go before you. So I think one of the things for us is knowing our job, our time, and our role. What is, what is the know your role, which was the great wrestler of the rock who used to say that? Know your role. There's another part of that line I won't repeat. Or, or well, who is the Bulls coach? Uh, went to coach the Timberwolves. Somebody remind me. Thibodeau. Thibodeau, who said, do your job, right? Knowing your role and doing your job is enough to be obedient to God in your time. The wisdom of Moses is seen also in how he listens to God. God tells him, you're not going in. And God has told him that he's appointed Joshua to be his successor. So again, I'm not saying that God doesn't use and appoint significant human leaders for a time, but nobody's irreplaceable, nobody's indispensable, nobody should ever be elevated to the position of God. And the idea of Moses not going in the promised land to the Israelites must have been terribly unsettling. Think about them, that. This is the guy who their parents saw lead them across the Red Sea. This is the guy who stood up to Pharaoh. This is the guy who you know, God used to send the plagues. This is the guy. He's not coming in? That's hostile territory. There's full of people that are enemies of God's people. We're, we, it's not going to be easy. He's not going with us. It must have been terrifying to them. Moses is saying, it's not me who's led you this far. It's God. And then we come to the empowering of Joshua. The name Joshua is an interesting name. Some of you will know this, or you can figure this out. The name Joshua in Hebrew literally means God is salvation. And it's Jesus, Yeshua, is the, is, the, is the sort of corrupted Aramaic ver Hebrew version of Joshua. It's the same name. In, Hebrew, in, he in the root Hebrew language, Joshua and, and Yeshua, Joshua and Jesus are the same name. They both mean the Lord's, Lord is salvation. So Moses is handing over power to a man whose name is God is salvation. That's not, that's not accidental. Moses recognized that God has chosen Joshua, just as he's, he previously chose Moses. You'll remember that story. If you've never read it, you can go back and read it this week at Exodus 3 and 4. tells the story of God calling Moses to go back to Egypt. Moses, you remember, grew up in Pharaoh's palace, spent the first 40 years of his life trying to be somebody important. Trying to, and then he ended up killing uh, an Isra uh, uh, Egyptian slave master and had to run for his life. Mary's a woman. Miriam lives in the desert, to his, and he works for his father-in-law, Jethro, on the backside of nowhere. He's tending sheep for his father-in-law. Not exactly a success story on the world stage. And that's when God calls with the burning bush to send him back into Egypt, into Egypt to free the people. And he argues with God. Send somebody else. I'm not very good with speech. Surely, what if they ask me who you are? It's a fascinating little argument, and God just tells him, I am who I am, now go. Finally, Moses says, I don't want to. And God still sends him, and he does. And you know that story. Look back for a minute at the text on your, in your, that's printed in Deuteronomy 31. In verse 6 and in verse 8, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And in verse 8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Two commands with a promise kind of smashed in the middle there that's repeated. Don't be afraid. It's the most commonly given command in all the Bible. The most common command is some form of fear not or don't be afraid. Why do you think that is? Why would the most commonly given command in all the Bible be do not be afraid? Well, maybe because we are. Because we wrestle with that. Possibly because fear is a big deal for us. 
We, as men, sometimes don't like to admit it, don't want to talk about it, but there's a lot of fear in the world today. There's a lot of fear in our own hearts. Some of that's fear of ourselves and fear of our past and fear of the future and fear of failure, not measuring up. Sometimes fears we can't even name. They're just in the background of our mind and of our soul. The most commonly given command in all of God's word to us is do not be afraid. And before that, he says, be strong and courageous. And in between there is this promise, I'm with you. I won't leave you. I go before you. Remember my, my old high school football coach used to use the, talk about the 101st and the 82nd Airborne. When I was a high school kid, I didn't know what that meant, but he always talked about them. And he, he defined courage as those who were afraid, but they went anyway. He had little uh, patches and insignia from World War II. I think he had some friends who served. And he would talk about that with us. You know, we're 16. We're like, okay, coach. But he said, those who were afraid, they went anyway. And then you start to read about and, and learn about what was asked of those young men. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is what you do with your fear. The only difference between someone who's courageous and someone who's a coward is what do they do with their fear. And in the Christian life, the Christian life is not always the absence of fear. It's what do you do with your fear? Where do you put it? Who do you go to with it? How do you handle it? So over and over again, God tells us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Moses says, I'm no longer able to lead you. He understood that his, he's no longer central, as we said. But he knows who is. And he recognizes Joshua publicly, which I think is fascinating. He, he does, it's, it's his classic leadership transition stuff. He's passing the, the mantle to Joshua. He's publicly saying in front of the people who are nervous about the whole situation, this is the one that God has chosen. This is the one I believe in. In fact, two and a half years ago in this very room, when our church voted on me as the lead pastor, when Brian was transitioning out of that role, he stood right here and said something, well, not out of Deuteronomy, but it felt similar to me. I felt like the Joshua in the story, publicly passing on the mantle. And it doesn't have to be leading a million people in the, in the wilderness or leading a church. In your own life, there are young men that God's placed you around who, to invest in, to lead, to make a difference in. And there comes a time when you need to say publicly what you see in them for their sake and for the people around them. Maybe that's in your business. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's just in your own relationships. Who's the Joshua to you? We often think about who's the Moses to me. Well, maybe you've passed that window, right? <laughs> maybe that's you now for somebody else. <clears throat> Moses encouraged Joshua in these two, these two words he says, be strong and courageous. I want to come back to these and focus on these for just a minute. Joshua's entering hostile territory. It's not going to be easy. He needs to know it, that you need strength and courage. The words, the Hebrew words for strength and courage there, be strong and courageous, are the word for strength is the word kasak. C-H-A-Z-A-K. Kasak. It, it, it's uh, it, it's talking about st uh, strength of character and strength of will. The word for courageous is the word amats. It had to do with like, um, it, like the like, like like warrior's stare is the what it actually referred to in Hebrew. And in fact, these two words, which Joshua will repeat, in Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 and 9, God, he repeats to his own people, be strong and courageous, the Lord your God goes with you. Where did he get that from? He got it from Moses, the one who said it about him. Be strong and courageous, the Lord will never leave you. Joshua says this later on, and he got it from, the one, from God who gave it to Moses who gave it to him. That's the channel of leadership, from God to you to someone else. I remember when my, old, my oldest son Noah was scared. I've forgotten why now. It was at night, and I heard them giggling, Ben, ben my youngest son, and Noah, the little guys, in their room, and I walked in, and Noah had said that he was scared of something, and Benji said to him, oh, Noah, don't be scared. Jesus is with you. And Noah started laughing. He thought it was funny that his little brother was encouraging him, but it was profoundly biblical advice. 
My uh, oldest son, Noah, as I mentioned, now is, um, is a senior at Wheaton College. He plays his last college game, likely, this Saturday, last time in the stands as a dad watching my son play. I'll still go to football games till I'm toothless and brainless because I like it. But, uh, but, he, but I'll, but I'll uh, the last time watching him, the end of an era is coming. They have an outside chance of making the NCAA Division III playoffs, but it's unlikely. Anyway, so I just see it all coming to an end for him, and I'm very proud of him, and I'm very emotional about it, and, you know, it's been a good, great experience. Anyway, the theme for their team, they have a theme every year at Wheaton College, and, la- and two years ago, um, the, the theme for their team was a Hebrew phrase, rock kasak. That, those words, that became the he- Israelite war cry. Once they entered the promised land and they had these battles with the Philistines and the Amalekites and, and, and the different tribes, the Israelite war cry was the word rock kasak. And the root of it is what is said right here in Deuteronomy 31 and what's repeated in Joshua 1, Str- be strong and courageous, kasak amats. And they played at my son's, uh, one of the team chapels I went to, they played this little video which I had edited down to play for you because I think it says it better than I could say it. And, um, and after you watch this, you'll probably want to put on a helmet and run through the wall, but anyway. <laughs> so let's, let's roll this video about Kasak and Amats. So this has been the ancient war cry throughout all the generations of the Hebrew nation. Rock! Kasak! Where does it come from? Kasak, this is the Hebrew, the rock-like oomph of the spiritually zealous heart, the game face of a mighty man, tenacity of soul, the gritting of the teeth of the spirit-inspired warrior, and the bearing of those teeth to the enemy. Kasak is possessing a resolute and growling resolve for the glory of God. The Hebrew statement is Barak Kasak. However, in the Bible, where that came from, it's Kasak Imats. The other word that goes with it, Imats. It's heavenly audacity. It's rushing headlong into the most hazardous and impossible battles without pausing to consider the impossibilities. That's the loss. Mere men and women on earth are eaten up by the enemy. However, we're not just mere men and women of this earth. We are redeemed. We are bought with a price, and we've been changed into the body of Christ. A means swift-footed, all-believing, super-conquering, prevailing faith in the Lord of battles. What happens to the world if Christians once again get Kasak and Amats? You know what the apostles had after Pentecost? Something came into them. What was it? You can say it very simply. Kasak and Amats. The Spirit of God. He came in to win. He came in to turn this world on its head. Moses' last gasp, this is his great speech before the promised land, which he never got to enter into. And he's laying out the ground rules for the kingdom that is about to be established across that Jordan River. Be strong and of good courage. Kasak, Amats, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that does go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Kasak Amats! courage for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them and thou shalt cause them to inherit it well, what's happening there the men and women of God are coming to take what was purchased the promise you are surrounded by 31 hostile empires you know, that's what they were headed into 31 empires on the other side of that Jordan River 31 This is where we are at as the Church of Jesus Christ, yet we are there without a war cry. Let's understand that we are out to win for the glory of Jesus Christ. And even if we die, we win. Doesn't matter what happens to our bodies. We obey, God wins. Now suddenly we're crossing. Joshua is the same name for Jesus in the New Testament, by the way, Yeshua. This is the Savior, the man of salvation, who has come in to bring us into the inheritance. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Rock to sock. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever. 
whatsoever. Now goes Rock Kasak, Israel. Rock Kasak, men and women of God Almighty. All the powers of earth and hell that come against your soul, and all the powers of earth and hell that are puppeteering the lost masses, you hit them square in the teeth, and you show love to this world. To anyone who would spit in your face, you serve them, and you love them in return, and say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Rock sock, Israel. <laughs> you can imagine a room full of 100 college guys watching that. I cut out the highlight portion parts in the beginning. What I liked about it, just in terms of the just the motivation, and it's true, is when it talks about this, this war cry and this gritting of the teeth and this fighting the enemy, we tend to think the enemy's out there. It's those people who don't believe or are different than, are different than us. That's not the enemy. You already said at the end, you show love to this world. The enemy is, the, the struggle the, the, where you need strength and courage is not to defeat the people who don't believe like you believe. The struggle is to be a humble, obedient man. It's to love and serve the Lord your God, to live your life with integrity, purity, honesty. It's hard, isn't it? That's not, that's a hard battle to fight to lead your family well, to love your neighbor well, to love and obey God well, is a very hard battle. And I, I, that's what Christ came to do, isn't it? The strength that it was not, would not have taken as much control of will and rock kasak amats of Christ to call 10,000 angels and wipe out the Romans. That would have been easy. But to go to the cross took kasak and amats, right? Strength and courage. That's the battle for all of us. That's the, the life God's called us to. And, he, and, and courage, like verse 31, 6, be strong and courageous. That's the, part A. Only makes sense if you believe in your soul that part B is true. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you wherever you go. For the Christian man, that's where courage comes from. It's not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, mustering up to this, you know, I'm going to go get him. It's, I, I can be, live with Kasach and Amatz because I know God is with me. I know because of the cross, he'll never leave me. I know he loves me. I know he forgives me. That's like the undergirding that gives me strength and courage in my life. So you've got some questions to deal with around your tables. Moses, here's the end of his career as a leader. Joshua, just beginning his leadership. Which character do you more identify with? The one kind of like Moses saying, I'm past my prime. I can't lead you. Or Moses, where you're stepping into a role. Then question two, which is one we all wrestle with. Who is your Moses? Who is your Joshua? And I think the most important question, if God, and it's not an if, it's he is. God is saying to you, be strong and courageous. What's he talking about in your life? Where do you most need the Kasak and the Mats that comes from knowing he's with you? All right, I'll leave it to your tables, and then I'll come up and wrap us up in prayer in a few minutes.